Well, good morning. It's uh, lovely to be with you and it's a privilege as always uh, to bring God's word to you this morning. Uh, bring the greetings from uh, Patricia and uh, we uh, remember you as a church often uh, in our prayers. Uh, what I would like to do this morning is to look at Psalm 44 and then this evening to look at Psalm uh, 45. But uh, before we read God's word together and, and go and into the study together, uh, let's just pray that the Lord will, will bless this time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together this morning. Uh, we thank you that we can meet around your word. We thank you that your word speaks into every situation of our lives. And our desire is this morning is that as we gather around it, that we would hear you uh, speak through it. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. We thank you, O Holy Spirit, that you uh, grant us understanding of your word. And we would pray, O Lord, that we would know that uh, this morning too. And above all, as we come to your word, we thank you for the living word. We thank you for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we would pray that as we uh, look at your word together, we pray that you would come and that you would meet with us. We ask all these things. Uh, for your glory's sake, in Jesus' name. So then let's read together uh, Psalm 44. We'll read the whole of the psalm and uh, then look at it to see what the Lord has to say through it. Psalm 44, verse 1. O God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the, the, the land, nor did their own arm save them. But by your right hand and your arm and the delight of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes, through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes. You have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name for ever. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have not made us turn back from the foe. Those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbours, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us for ever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. May God bless his word to us. As we look at this psalm together then. I'm sure I don't need to, to remind any of you, certainly if you have uh, been a Christian for any length of time, that you will know that the Christian life here on this earth is often a, a bit of a roller coaster, that there are ups and downs, 
there are valleys and mountain tops. And sometimes in the midst of it all, we know the paths that lead us beside the still waters. And we know God's presence and we know God's blessing upon us. Circumstances can be tough at times and we can struggle. Uh, we can wonder why things happen to us and we don't understand what God's will is in our lives. How do we respond as God's people when we don't know the Lord's presence? You know, there can be times, can't there, when we drift away and it usually is a drift. Nothing very dramatic, but slowly sin creeps in and we find that our times with the Lord are getting shorter and seem to be drier and more difficult. And slowly we drift away and then suddenly we realise that the Lord is not with us. Isn't that the picture that is painted for us in the Song of Solomon in chapter 5 when the beloved is asleep and suddenly she realises her bridegroom is not with her? And she feels, sees his hand on the latch and she rushes to open it. But she doesn't rush to open it, does she? That's the problem, is that she lies and she thinks, well, why should I get out of bed? I'm, I'm asleep. My, I don't want to get my feet dirty. But eventually she does and then she finds that her beloved has departed. And so often that can be our experience as Christians too, can't it? We feel and know God's call on our lives and yet we, we don't respond. And the only thing that we can do in situations like that is, as the beloved did in the Song of Solomon, she went into the streets of the city and she sought to find him. Sin can cloud our relationship with our Saviour at times, can't it? Isn't that what David's experience was in Psalm 51, where he cries out for the Lord to cleanse him after his sin with Bathsheba and his uh, cause of, of putting Uriah to death, her husband? And he has to cry out that the Lord would cleanse him. And sometimes we are in that position. We know that we have done wrong and we know that we have to come to our God and to seek repentance. What a mercy it is to know that in such situations, that as the scripture promises us, that if we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive them. And we have a saviour who has, who has died for us and his love for us does not depend on us, but is totally dependent upon him and upon his love, his eternal love for us. And we know that as we come to him and we seek forgiveness, we know that he will forgive us. But then there are times in the Christian life when there seems to be no reason for God uh, to have left us. And that's the situation that we find here in this psalm, in this Psalm 44. And it's clear that this is, a, is the position in Psalm 17. Uh, the psalmist writes this, All this has come upon us, although we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. If we've forgotten your name, if we've forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secret of the heart. Yes, there can be times when, even without there being any apparent reason, that we don't know the presence of God. I'm sure that was what Job's experience was. We know from uh, the word of God that Job, what Job was experiencing was the trials of the evil one, but he didn't know that. And sometimes we can feel that God is not with us. But in this psalm, it seems even worse. Not only is God not present, but he seems to be against them. And we can know that too. Just read verses 9 to 16. And we see these words, you, you God, talking to God, you've rejected us and disgraced us. You have not gone out with our armies. You've made us turn back from our foe. Those who hate us have gotten the spoil. And later on, in, at the end of that little section in verses 15, all day long my disgrace is before me, the shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sound sight of the enemy and the avenger. How do we respond to our God when we experience such times? 
Well, I believe this psalm helps us not to understand perhaps why we're going through it, but to understand the response that God wishes to see in his people at such times. What do we see? Well, we see at the beginning of the psalm that the psalmist refers to the Lord who is for his people in verses 1 to 3. O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the delight of your face, for you delighted in them. The psalmist here rehearses what the Lord has done for his people. He reminds, uh, he's reminding God, God, oh Lord God, we have heard what you have done. We've heard with our ears. We, we, we have the history lessons. We can see the way that you've acted for your people in the past. And he's reminding himself that God is a God who acts, who is concerned for his people. So much so that by his own hand he drove out the nations, referring back to the time as the children of Israel were going into uh, the land of Canaan and how God went before them and drove the people out. And it wasn't by their own strength, it wasn't by their own armies that, 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 that these were defeated. Just consider the battle of Jericho, the walls of Jericho. What a foolish sight it would have been to see these people just marching round the walls of Jericho day after day. What on earth do they think they're doing? And suddenly on that last day, as the trumpets blow, all the walls fall down and there is a, a, a mighty victory for God's people. How did that come about? Only because the, the Lord their God was fighting for them. He afflicts the peoples, we read, in, in, in verse 2, you afflicted the peoples, but God's people he set free. He wins the victory for them. And what's more, we read this at the end of that little section, that God delighted in his people. You know, we need to remind ourselves of such things. And as we read these things, we can see what God did for the children of Israel those thousands of years ago, <clears throat> those thousands of years ago. But has not the Lord God done such things for us too, for us in the 21st century? Hasn't Jesus fought for us? How does Paul put it at the end of that amazing chapter in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, that chapter which deals with the importance and centrality of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that if the Jesus be not risen, then we are uh, we have no hope. But this is what he says at the end in verses fifty-four. But when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death. Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The other, uh, the other day, I was driving up to, uh, to Pat's home, and I had the Messiah on. And uh, that glorious chorus that talks about, but thanks, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has fought for us. The Lord Jesus Christ has won the battle for us. Oh, we have, we can rejoice in this, even in the midst of these difficulties. Jesus' victory does not depend on how we feel. But it depends on the work that he has done, that he has died on the cross, that he's risen again. As he says in John 10, he has power to lay down his life and he has power to take it up again. It wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross, but it was his own love for sinners such as us. It wasn't the tombstone 
that kept him in the tomb. But he burst through that. He's conquered death. The Lord Jesus Christ has fought for us and he has won the victory. You know, already perhaps as we consider these things, even if we're feeling uh, uh, as though we were struggling this morning to understand what God maybe is trying to do in, in our lives as individuals and as a church, we can rejoice this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ is the victor, that he is King of Kings and that he is Lord of Lords. We notice that, God, uh, that the psalmist reminds God that he set the children of Israel free, referring perhaps to the uh, to the coming out of, of, of Egypt and the passing through the Red Sea where they had been in bondage and yet God wonderfully, miraculously brought them through the Red Sea and brought them into freedom. And hasn't the Lord Jesus Christ given us freedom this morning? Hasn't the fact that if we trust in him as our Lord and Saviour, we know that sin, our sin has been forgiven? That we are free from the power, uh, um, perhaps not the presence of sin, but we're free from the, from the power of sin. We one day will be free from the presence of sin. That glorious hymn of Charles Wesley, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and follow thee. The Lord Jesus Christ has set us free. God has set us free from sin. That we no, need, no longer need to worry about the consequences of sin. That we know that our sin has been forgiven. That God's justice has been answered. And that we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. And therefore we are free in him. And then this lovely phrase at the end of chapter three you delighted in them god delighted in his people dear friend this morning as you listen to this if you're feeling down remember this that god delights in you he has set his love upon you go back uh, after this and read ephesians 1 and see all of what the the Lord God has done for you in, uh, in Jesus Christ. That he's predestined you, that he's chosen you, that you've been adopted into his family, that you have the earnest, the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. That's how much God loved you from even before the foundations of the world. That he set your love upon you. He's delighted in you. You this morning. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the church at Libanus this morning is the apple of his eye and he delights in you and he cares for you. What a comfort that is, even in the midst of uh, confusion and difficulty and maybe feeling forsaken. Your God loves you and he delights in you. But not only is the Lord for his people, but he is also the Lord who is our King. And we read this in verses 4 to 8. You are my King, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes, through, you, your, uh, through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes. You have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually and we will give thanks to your name forever. You see, the psalmist, even in the midst of these problems, has not lost his trust in his God. You are my God, O King. This King hasn't abdicated. He has not decided that he is no longer going to act as a King. Over lockdown, Pat and I have been uh, periodically looking at the, the series of The Crown. And uh, right at the beginning of that, where we have the abdication of, uh, is it King Edward VI? And you see the heartache and the sadness that that abdication 
caused and the difficulty and the turmoil. Our King Jesus has not abdicated. He is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords and will be for eternity. And we notice that he is still trusting in God. He realises that the only hope for his people is that God would ordain salvation, that God will bring his salvation to pass. But notice there's a change here. The psalmist in verse 4 is talking in the singular. You are my God, O King. But then in verse 5 and later on in, in this little section, he uses we. Through you we push down our foes. You see, these feelings of, of, of rejection can come upon us not only as individuals, but it can come upon us as churches and perhaps even as nations too, but particularly as churches as God's people. And you know, sometimes as churches we can feel that God has rejected us, that God is not fighting for us. But what do we see that they're doing as, as God, as, as his people? We notice that they are still looking to him. The psalmist says, for not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. The psalmist realises that he cannot find any help within himself in this situation. But he knows God. You have saved us from our foes. You have put to shame those who hate us. In you we have boasted continually. And we will give thanks to your name forever. They're looking to the Lord to fight for them, to be their strength. And that is exactly what we should be doing. We should realise so often in these situations we think we can find our own way out. So often we think, well, if God is not, if God is not acting for us, then uh, uh, we'll, we'll try our own way. We'll try our own methods. We'll try our own things. But no, 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 that is not the way. The way is is that we realise and we trust in the God who can fight for us, the God who does fight for us. And they acknowledge that God gives them the victory. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a glorious verse which I read uh, recently in going through the Psalms, and it's quite an unusual verse. It's found in, in Psalm 18, verse 29, and he says this, for by you, that is God, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. We may feel we have a, a, an impossible wall to scale in front of us at the moment. We may feel that there is no way through. We may feel that the armies of the enemy are coming towards us and we have no hope. Yes, the psalmist says, even by my God, I can leap over this wall. It doesn't matter how high or how wide it is. But by God, by God's strength, we can have the victory. And this is what the psalmist is looking for here. He's reminding himself, he's reminding the people, he's reminding God, Lord, our only hope is in you. And we notice too, that even this, in this situation, they are still worshipping the Lord. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks uh, to your name forever. Isn't it often in times when we feel as though God has forsaken us, as though when we feel rejected, that our worship goes downhill very rapidly? We almost feel as though it should be quid pro quo, that if we worship God, then uh, the, the, the Lord God should come and act for us. No, no. Our God is the mighty God of heaven. Our God is the Lord God of heaven. Our God is our creator God. And he is a God who is worthy of worship at all times. We can try to fight our own way out. But we will never succeed. You know those verses at uh, the end of, of Habakkuk. Let me just uh, turn to it. In Habakkuk chapter 3. What tr tremendous verses of faith they are. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree should not blossom, though we are, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. What does he say he's going to do? Forsake God? 
No, he doesn't. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on the high places. No wonder, he says at the end of that, to the choir master with stringed instruments, here is a song to be sung, a God to be worshipped, the Lord God, the Lord is my strength. I will rejoice in the Lord, even though I, I'm facing incredible difficulty. I don't know where the ha ha what the way forward is, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. My God has saved me. He's loved me with an everlasting love. He sent his son to die for me. My salvation is sure. I will rejoice in the Lord. And yet, in the midst of this, even though the psalmist is saying this, he's struggling. And there is, there should be no uh, shame that at times we struggle. Even though he says we will give thanks to your name forever. What's the next verse? But, verse 9, you have rejected us and disgraced us. You know, sometimes, uh, more often than not, there are buts in the Bible which cause us to rejoice. But God came, but God did this. Here's a but which goes in the opposite direction. But you have rejected and disgraced us. So I read this. The thing that struck me was the brutal honesty of the psalmist. Let's remember that this was in a public prayer. This was something which was to be sung at the beginning of of uh, at the beginning of the of the psalm. It's something which is to go to the choir master. In other words, it's something which is to be set to music, something which is to be said publicly. How would we respond if somebody in our prayer meeting stood up and said, God, you've rejected us and you've disgraced us? And going on, how would we react if somebody in our prayer meeting stood up and cried out to God, wake, wake, awake? Verse 23, awake, wake up. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. I'm sure if somebody did that in our prayer meeting, maybe somebody would take them aside and say, uh, yeah, that's not quite right. You have to, uh, you must remember that our God never slumbers nor sleeps. But you know, there are times when we need to be honest with God. Doesn't he say uh, earlier on that God knows the secret of our hearts? And often we can feel like this in the depths of our hearts. And why shouldn't we put them into words? God knows what we're thinking. Why shouldn't we cry out if this is what we feel? This cry of God to wake up perhaps reminds us of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and the taunt that Elijah made to the prophets of Baal. Perhaps your God is asleep. Perhaps he's on a journey. Perhaps he doesn't know what's going on. And the taunt that Elijah made. But this is completely different. You see, although at times we feel that our God may be, it feels as though he may be asleep and we cry to him to wake up. Our God does never slumber nor sleeps. The Baal God was dead, didn't exist, was a figment of their imagination. Our God is alive. Our God is active. Our God is awake. Our God is the sovereign God of heaven. Our God is the one who has this world in control. Our God is the one who knows even if a sparrow falls to the ground. Our God knows that the very number of, 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 of hairs on our head. And yet still, we can cry out to him from the depths of our heart. If this is what we feel, Lord, wake, 
rouse yourself, come to us. You see the concern of God's people. We haven't got time to go through the whole list, but we get a, a, a picture of it, don't we, that they feel rejected and disgraced, that because God hasn't gone out with them, then they have known defeat and their enemies seem to be rejoicing over it. You've made us like sleep, sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. They feel as though they've been sold into slavery. You've sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You've made them the taunt. Isn't it comforting to know that when we feel like this, that we are not on our own? That God's people have felt times like this, even down through the years, through the centuries. We notice that they can be honest about it, that all this has come upon them even though they have not forgotten God. Verse 17, all this has come upon us though we have not forgotten you and we've not been false to your covenant. We can be honest Lord, we've come to worship you. We've wanted to know your presence. We've wanted to know your word coming to us. We've not wanted to know you answering our prayers. We've wanted to know the gospel to go forth with power. We've wanted to see people coming to know and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you know our hearts. We know that we're far from perfect. We know that we have sinned against you. We know that we have the struggle with sin. But Lord, we have sought to worship you in spirit and truth by the power of your Holy Spirit. And yet, Lord, it seems as though you have rejected us. Yes, we can cry out in such times. But I think we can also take comfort, can't we? In verse 22, we read this, Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Doesn't that verse perhaps take us back or take us forward to uh, Isaiah 53? Where we, that, uh, that uh, chapter which refers so clearly to the sacrifice, to the death and to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners such as us. And in verses six and seven, we read this. In verse seven, we read this, he was oppressed, that's Jesus. He was afflicted, yet he opens not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is put before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You see, as we go through times like this, we have a savior who understands exactly how we feel. We have a saviour who does, who, 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 uh, a great high priest uh, who, who does feel with us. It's that verse in Hebrews reminds us that he is, he, 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 he is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. That he knows what it like, he knows what it's like to feel rejected. And yet his rejection was far greater than ours by in any, in any, any, any level of degree. That the Lord Jesus Christ, as he hung there on the cross, knew the rejection of his heavenly Father. He knew the rejection, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he hung there and suffered for our sin. And we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can come to our Saviour in times like this. And we can cry out to him and we can say, Lord, you know what it's like. You know what it's like in a far greater degree than we can ever know. But we are feeling rejected. We feel as though we're sheep uh, to be slaughtered. We feel as though we have no hope. Lord Jesus, come to us. Comfort us. Strengthen us. Help us to go on in these difficult times. That verse in, uh, in, in verse 22, uh, the Apostle Paul takes up and uses in that great chapter, uh, Romans 8, where he's talking about 
the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God. At the end of that chapter, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, here's the verse, for your sake we are, kill we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. The early church knew what it was to feel like this in the midst of their persecution. I'm sure many of them felt that God had rejected them. They'd done nothing wrong. They'd sought to serve their God. They'd sought to worship him. They'd sought to spread the gospel. And yet this persecution came upon them and they felt as though they were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. They felt they had no hope. And yet in the midst of that situation, the Apostle Paul reminds us that nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine or nakedness or danger or sword, COVID-19, a dud economy that seems to be struggling, that is really struggling, a health service that's struggling. None of these things shall separate us from the love of God. No, as the Apostle Paul goes on, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, no virus, no cancer, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In the midst of feeling as though God has forsaken, take comfort from the promise of his word. Our faith is not built on our feelings, but it's built on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is built on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who has died for us, the one who is the Lamb that was slain, the one who is the Lion of Judah. Jesus Christ is our hope in the midst of these things. When we feel like this, we've already perhaps touched on this, how do we respond? We've already talked about the, uh, the vehemence with which the psalmist prays. Uh, why, uh, wake up, why are you sleeping? He talks about the anguish. Why do you hide your face? At times like this, sometimes we can almost take the attitude of que sera, sera. Well, that's, what, that's how it is. No, no, no. We must not be like that. We must cry out, Lord, why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Lord, we feel as though we're bowed down. We feel as though we're almost like uh, groveling in the dust, groveling in the ground. Our belly clings to the ground. The honesty of it. We need to be honest as God's people. We need to be honest to be able to tell the Lord God how we feel. And we need to be honest with one another to tell one another how we feel. And then the cry goes up. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Lord, for no other reason but come to us. Because your everlasting love is upon us. You've loved us from eternity. Lord, come to us. Let us know the presence. Let us know the delight of your face. Let us know the thrill in our hearts and in our souls of you coming to us. Of the thrill of knowing your words speaking to us. The thrill of knowing our, our, our prayers ascending into heaven. Of the thrill of knowing that we are your children and that you have loved us. And God does answer. And that's what we will look at tonight in Psalm 45. These Psalms are not put together randomly, but under the inspiration of the Spirit, Psalm 45 follows on from Psalm uh, 44. And in that Psalm, we meet the bridegroom and the bride and the description of the bridegroom is beyond telling you are the most handsome 
of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Gird up your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one. Your throne, O God, is for ever and ever. The Lord Jesus Christ does come to his people. The night of mourning is soon turned into a morning of joy when Jesus comes to us. Are you cast down this morning as a believer? Do you feel that God has forsaken to you, has forsaken you? Don't be dismayed. Cry out to him. Remember what the Lord God has done for you. Remember that he still is the Lord God who is worthy to be worshipped and come and worship him. But cry out to him to come to you. And he who is the mighty God will come to you. Look to your Saviour. Look to Jesus. Look to the one who has borne the punishment of your sin. But maybe there's somebody who's watching this uh, video and who feels cast down but has no hope because the things that we have been talking about have seemed foreign to you. You have never known an experience of God in your life. You have never known the Lord Jesus coming to you. You have no hope if you remain in that state. Let me plead with you, fall on your knees, cry out to God to be merciful, cry out to Jesus to save you. Acknowledge that there is nothing that you can do to save yourself, that you have no hope of making yourself right with God. But Jesus Christ died for sinners. Jesus Christ died for people like you and me so that by his grace, by his mercy, by his death on our behalf, we can come and we can come into the presence of the living God. We can know our sin is forgiven. We can know peace with God. Cry to him. Cry to him to save you. Trust in him as the only one who is able to save you. Yeah, the Christian life, as we've looked at this morning, does have big ups and big downs. There are times of thrill and joy. There are times of difficulty and heartache. But through it all, our God is faithful. If you know Jesus, his love is upon you forever and ever. No matter what situation you go through, you will be kept safe. Because our Saviour, our Jesus, is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's laid down his life for us. He's taken, he took up his life again. And he has promised that none shall pluck him out of his hand or out of his Father's hand. In this world where safety is so rare, if can be found at all really, there is a safe place and it's found in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found by knowing Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. Will you not come to him if you've never known him and ask him to save you? Even now, as we come to the end of this sermon. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that you are such a glorious and great God. Lord, we know that there are times when we can feel like this psalmist, we can feel rejected, we can feel cast down, we can feel as though you don't uh, care for us. But Lord, we praise you and we thank you that we know that that's not true, but we would cry out to you, Lord. We would pray, we would ask, O oh Lord, that you would come to us. We would ask, O oh Lord, that we would know that sense of you uh, waking up, of rousing yourself, of coming to our aid, coming to presence yourself with us so that we may delight again in who you are. 
Pray for each one here, Lord. Pray each one listening to, the, uh, to this. We pray, O oh Lord, that for those who know you and who love you, that they may be comforted by the thought that the Lord Jesus Christ is their Lord, is their Saviour, that, that they are indeed the apple of your eye. And Lord, for those who don't know you, pray that you would give them no peace. Pray that you give them no peace until they know Jesus uh, as their Lord and Saviour. So, Lord, we thank you that your word speaks into every situation in our lives. We praise you and we thank you for who you are. And we pray that your blessing would be upon us for your glory's sake. Amen.